Mark Keim, founder of DisasterDoc here with Module 15 on Tornadoes. Let's go over those learning objectives together. After completing today's lecture, students will be able to define the word tornado, recognize the conditions necessary for tornadoes to form, recognize average and maximum dimensions related to these tornadoes, recognize the peak times of day and times of year for tornado incidents in the United States, and also identify the enhanced Fujita scale, which is used for ranking tornado strength. We'll also compare the characteristics of weak, strong, and violent tornadoes. We'll list the main cause of death in tornado disasters. We'll identify those major public health consequences of tornadoes, and we'll identify the 10 tornado disasters with the highest death tolls. And we'll also recognize measures that lessen the health impact of tornado disasters. Tornado definition, it's a violently rotating column of air, often but not always visible as a funnel-shaped cloud. It's usually in contact with the ground and the cloud base, and we can see those in both cases. If it's not uh, touching the ground itself, it's called a funnel cloud. But once you have that contact between the cloud base and the ground, that's when the definition of tornado is actually uh, most appropriate. Now the formation of tornadoes occurs when, when they actually begin as severe as thunderstorms and then wind coming into that storm starts to swirl and forms a funnel. The air in the funnel spins faster and faster and it creates this low pressure area and then sucks more air and objects inside the tornado, bringing them up through the funnel itself and then uh, dropping them down. There are several different patterns for tornado dimensions. I want to talk about a few of those. Ground speed, the length of the path of the tornado when it's on the ground, and also the width of that path on the ground as well. So ground speeds, the average tornado ground speed is about 40 miles per hour, and usually a maximum that has been measured is actually 75 miles per hour. That's a good indicator for what we'd expect to be the average and the max. In addition, the length of the path itself is about averaging a 4.4 miles. However, the maximum recorded in the United States has actually been 219 miles. Very unusual, but has actually occurred uh, during the 20th century. And then the width of the path itself, average of about 384 feet, so a little wider than a football field. The maximum, however, has been up to three miles wide. Now, there are peak times of the day when tornadoes occur in the United States, and I, I want to go through this uh, information a little bit just to better understand how tornadoes form and why they're occurring in these uh, peak times. The peak time of the day is actually 4 to 6 p.m. That's at the time of day when uh, much of the heat of the day is actually built up, and that energy, that heat energy, has been transferred into these thunderstorm formations as well. The peak time of year is actually between April and June, and why is that the case in the United States? That's a time of transition of the, of the seasons from springtime until summer. So we still have cold weather, and we also have warm weather, and these transitions when a, a warm front is setting in an area and a cold front comes through, that's a time when it's ripe for tornado formation. So that's why we see more of a peak time of year um, during April and June as opposed to the hotter months in the United States in August and so on, and July where uh, uh, these it's, tornadoes still can occur during this period of time, but not as common because we don't see those extremes of temperature exist uh, during those particular months or other winter months, for example. Now, there were nearly 30,000 tornadoes reported in the United States in a 40-year period between the 1950s and the 1990s. So it gives you sort of an idea. There's a lot of tornadoes happening, nearly 800 a year, just in this one country alone in, in the United States. And the United States does have the most tornadoes of any other country in the world. This figure actually shows you a little bit about the enhanced Fujita scale, and I don't want to get too uh, in too much detail with you know getting into individual boxes with this, but I just want you to be aware that we have a, a scale where we measure tornado severity, and that's according to the wind damage um, that's uh, uh, that's uh, caused by these particular phenomenon. And it used to be just the wind alone, but and that was called the Fujita scale. But the enhanced Fujita scale also takes into consideration the amount of damage and the types of buildings that have been damaged. Obviously, if you have a tin, very uh, thin uh, shack or overlying carport and so on, something of a temporary structure, you can have a lot more damage to something like that as you could compare to a, a very uh, hard reinforced masonry structure, very hardened. And so therefore, you know, we have some difference in, of course, um, damage, and we have to take into consideration what has been damaged. And so many times, uh, th this can be reconstructed. By looking at the damage, um, experts can 
look at this damage in the particular community and then estimate what that wind speed would have been according to records of what we've seen the damages occur with these particular buildings. And so that gives us an idea of how to really be able to measure the severity and be able to report that and then compare it to other um, tornadoes of the same severity. Now this enhanced Fujita skill actually goes from an EF0, EF1, EF2, EF3, EF4, and EF5, and those are the most severe tornadoes, and we'll talk more detail about those uh, very severe tornadoes in the EF4, EF5. Some people actually just say F uh, in these particular examples as well, so it's F4, F5, and so on, so you'll hear me use those interchangeably. So with respect to size, we have three main categories of size of tornadoes. We'll call those weak, strong, and violent. The weak tornadoes comprise about 69% of all tornadoes. However, they cause only about 5% of the tornado deaths. Their lifetime is relatively brief, one to 10 minutes actually on the ground before they dissipate, and also wind speeds of less than 110 miles per hour. How does that translate into damage? We usually see some tree damage as far as leaves and foliage. We also see some roofing, for example, or windows broken, but not major structural damage when we're looking at you know, buildings and, and homes and so on. Strong tor tornadoes, on the other hand, the middle category, comprise about 29% of tornadoes, and actually nearly 30% of all tornado deaths are in this particular category. They stay on the ground longer, may last up to about 20 minutes or even longer than that, and their wind speeds range from 110 to about 205 miles per hour. So in this category now, we start having tornado wind speeds that actually can exceed those of hurricanes. And then this final category, this bears some paying some attention to because this category, we've heard, for example, the Joplin, Missouri tornado was in this category. Actually, I'll tell you a little bit more about the story about tornadoes that I was in. Um, but then that was also in this violent category. Only 2% of all tornadoes um, are in this particular category. However, 70% of all tornado deaths are in this violent category. Uh, the lifetime can actually exceed an hour, so they're very strong, they don't dissipate quickly, and the wind speeds are greater than 205 miles per hour, which you're talking about catastrophic damage, entire buildings destroyed um, by these particular uh, size of tornadoes. As we would expect, the major cause of death from tornadoes is traumatic injury. It's the debris, the wind itself is very, very, as we, we've seen here in the past, uh, very, very strong, high velocity wind speeds, and this carrying debris um, has a, a very destructive effect, both on the buildings that we may take cover in, or if we're out in the open, um, a lot of flying debris through the air as well that can really um, be a, a major cause of death in this example. In general, the public health consequences of tornadoes are relatively focalized, actually. In most cases, actually, it may hit one town, but not the town next to it. Um, these very large tornadoes that have happened in history back in the, uh, in the 1920s, actually, a very severe tornado, a multi-state tornado, occurred in the United States with very unusual, almost 220 miles uh, on the ground and did affect multiple cities. But for the most part, we see these relatively brief phenomenon that occur, and it may affect one town or several towns, but not the entire state, not the entire province, um, and certainly uh, not an entire nation like what we would see, for example, in some of the storms uh, that we've looked at, like uh, um, you know, tropical cyclones or earthquakes or tsunamis and so on that are these huge phenomenon. It's also very interesting. Sometimes, actually, you can see these smaller tornadoes in the moderate category that may hit one side of the street and leave the other side completely un untouched. And so it's a relatively... Uh, well, 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 relatively precise surgical strike in many cases where the path itself is very disrupted and then outside of that relatively spared. So we don't see these large broad uh, expanses of destruction, we actually see more focal. Um, deaths, however, can be few to moderate, of course, depending upon, once again, early warning systems and some other things we'll talk about. Severe injuries also can be few to, mod uh, few to moderate. However, um, also, once again, um, dependent upon the population, how many people were there in its path. Um, we, we do see this loss or damage of the healthcare system itself um, in tornadoes. Sometimes these hospitals can get a direct hit, like what happened a few years back in Joplin, Missouri, where the hospital itself was struck by the tornado, or what we see is this inundation of large amounts of injuries that may come um, within the first hour, first few hours 
hours of a tornado, and that uh, takes up a lot of resources in the hospital and then slows its ability to be able to take care of other types of uh, medical problems, uh, you know, babies being born, heart attacks, all the things that are normally going on uh, during that time as well. So there does uh, uh, appear to be some element of impact to the, to the healthcare system itself. Now, during the cleanup phase in particular, we do see a worsening of chronic disease in people as well because, you know, they're being more exposed to the elements, their ed uh, exercise levels may be changing, there may be dust in the air, there may also be um, other exposures as well, and more work and changes in diet, and we can see chronic illness worsen during that period of time. And of course, public concern for safety uh, being moderate to high in that, uh, just like any type of natural disaster where people's concern is then, uh, has, been, has then risen after the event itself. However, when we, the tornado is gone, people do sort of take a, a, a deep breath and, and realize that the danger is over. Now, they may have more uh, concern. They may be more vigilant in the future for these types of storms, but at least they know that that, that particular aspect is, is over for now. Um, compared, and why I'm saying that is comparing that to earthquakes, for example, where um, we also see these kinds of events. Um, you know, p earthquakes have aftershocks that remind you time and time again immediately afterwards. So with respect to public health consequences of tornado disasters, we see a more focalized effect. There, the number of deaths can actually be few to moderate, in addition to severe injuries also about the same. We do see a loss of the, or damage of the healthcare system itself, usually related to either a direct hit that the hospital has sustained, for example, like the Joplin, Missouri tornado a few years ago that occurred in the United States, or we see this inundation early on within the first few hours after the tornado of large numbers of casualties that may come in as a result of the tornado-related injuries. During the cleanup phase in tornadoes, we typically see chronic illnesses that worsen. We do see uh, worsening of asthma, for example, or emphysema or cardiovascular disease as well. We don't normally see this extensive large number of injuries that occur as what we would expect after a, a hurricane because of the large expansive area of a hurricane in comparison to a more focalized effect in tornadoes. But we do see um, tornado-related um, cleanup injuries, and so we have to be careful, get that message out to people during the cleanup phase so that they're not injuring themselves, falling, and having these other types of uh, uh, cleanup related injuries. In addition, the public concern for safety, uh, uh, of course, in, uh, related to tornadoes is, is very high. Um, however, people tend to start going back into a little bit more of a, of a normal phase relatively immediately. If we compare that, for example, to an earthquake that still has you know, aftershocks going on and reminders that this could occur immediately right after um, the event itself. Otherwise, we see focalized damage and focalized displacement of, of populations where only those homes that are in the tornado path are affected. And a relatively sort of surgical strikes, that meaning that you know one side of the, the street can actually be affected by a tornado and the other side nearly normal. Um, so we don't see this expansive uh, distribution of, of damages and injuries unless the tornado itself is relatively unusual and has a very, very long path. As we know, that's only a very small percentage of tornadoes overall. So tornado impact worldwide. United States, of course, number one um, nation with the most tornadoes, mostly due to the geography and the weather systems that occur with these mixtures of warm fronts and cold fronts that occur over a large continental area. We also see tornado impact in Canada, for example, as well. Russia, Australia, China, and actually, amazingly enough, also in Bangladesh. Bangladesh actually has many of the severe, uh, most severe tornadoes in world's history. As a matter of fact, the world's deadliest tornado kill 1,300 people and wounded nearly 12,000 people. This occurred in 1989 in Bangladesh. And that's a, I can tell you, that's a phenomenal number of people injured um, from one particular tornado. Approximately 80,000 people homeless. Once again, this mixture of uh, population density, severe tornado, lack of warning. And let's talk more about that um, when we look at these tornadoes worldwide as well. So when we consider the world's top 10 deadliest tornado disasters, one of the most striking things we see from this particular table is that Bangladesh is actually in that category seven out of 10 times of the most uh, deadly tornadoes in the past 50 years. And there are reasons for that we can talk about in, in particular. I also want to point out as well that Pakistan and India, so we're looking at South Asia as really being a very bad focus for these tornado uh, uh, fatalities. Um, and I want to mention 
mention that because I think that bears a little bit deeper dive and a little bit more study. Um, you know, one of the, we're seeing this mixture. Um, why does this occur so often in Bangladesh? Number one, Bangladesh has tornadoes. But two as well, we have these other um, factors that really work together. They converge together to increase the risk. Number one, poor population, low resource nation. So therefore, less ability to be able to provide forecasting, less ability to provide warning to the population and monitoring where we can actually pick those tornadoes up on radar and warn the population. In addition, the population being having less resources as well, less resources to be able to hear the warning, less resources are less plugged in to be able to act upon those warnings and take shelter appropriately. And so when we have this mixture of the hazard itself, um, low tech technological capabilities are low resources to be able to provide warnings and then a population that's also relatively poor and has less ability to be able to respond to those warnings now we're talking about a deadly combination and that's why we see Bangladesh at so high in these top 10 even though that the majority of the world's tornadoes actually occur in the United States so I want to share with you a little bit I I mentioned earlier during this presentation um, a little bit of my story in tornadoes so I, I actually uh, became interested in disasters and why I'm here talking to you, um, why I'm sharing this information with you and with such passion and, and, and I feel so strongly about saving lives is I became interested in tornadoes on May 29th, uh, 1982 at uh, 3.16 p.m. And why do I remember that time and that date? Now, that's because it's a very severe tornado, um, an F4, uh, they categorize it F4, maybe even an F5 tornado at points in time, actually came through my uh, hometown. Um, I was living in Marion, Illinois at the time, um, and this uh, severe tornado uh, went through our t city, actually uh, left 1,500 families homeless, and um, my family was one of them as well. Um, and in particular, uh, I learned about tornadoes um, not on that day, but I learned about it 15 years prior. And I wanted to share this with you because it really points to this lesson of risk reduction and the small things that we can do that save our lives. So let's go from that day in Marion um, in 1982. Let's go back uh, you know, uh, 15 years prior to that. Um, I was a young boy growing up in the Midwest and of course we heard time to time there were tornado warnings and, and watches and so on. And my family didn't have much money, um, but one of the things my mother did have money uh, for was um, buying books, and she always found um, enough money to be able to buy me books. And, and so I used to have this little newsletter, and some of you, we may be dating ourselves when we admit that we've read this uh, newsletter, but it was in the Midwest, and it was called The Weekly Reader. And so every week, uh, the, our school and class would get these, and the weekly reader was actually written at the reading level of the class itself there. So here I was in grade school, bought the weekly reader, and then at the back it had books that you could buy. And uh, so I went to my mother and I said, I want to buy this book, and she bought it for me, just a couple of dollars. And this book was on tornadoes. And so as a young boy, I read about the tornadoes of, once again, the things that you've just learned here. How fast do they move? And, and which direction do they move? And so on. And, and uh, how big are they? And how wide are they? And how do they behave? And where are the places that you can go to be safe from them? And how can you protect yourself from them? And so on. And I learned a couple of things um, about these tornadoes um, when I was a young boy. And then, now let's go back um, to that day of the tornado itself. And um, actually, we were in the, uh, in the yard um, um, my ho at my home and saw um, you know, clouds kind of rolling in. It was a beautiful, sunshiny day, um, unseasonably warm, and Memorial Day weekend, which is a holiday in the United States. So many people were out enjoying the, the warm weather in the springtime. So the, the season was changing to be warm weather. And I, we heard a siren go off in our, in our city. And the siren kept wailing and going and going and going. And um, it, we knew we had heard the siren before, but we had heard beca it because um, that's how the city would call together its volunteer fire department, was to call these um, firemen in, um, and then they would go out and fight the fire. They would normally stay in their homes and only come when the siren went on. And it would usually go for a minute or so and then shut off um, to notify these people. But this time, it didn't. 
And so we were standing in the yard and why, looking around, what, you know, what's that, what's that, why is the siren still going? And I happened to look off across in the horizon, and way off in the distance of the horizon, I could see this row of black clouds and this little tail coming out of the black clouds themselves and coming down to the ground. And I was, wow, that's the first tornado I had ever seen in my life. And of course, I recognized it right away. And, but yet, you know, where I was, it was a sunshiny day and so on. I could just see it on the horizon. So I knew that the tornado uh, was actually triggering this siren. And that it was actually a warning siren to take cover. So I ran back in the house, and knowing from that children's book, I pulled the kitchen table into the center of the house, and I put my wife underneath that table. And I knew that was the safest place if you could not get in a basement, which my house did not have a basement at that time. And it's then when I thought, you know, the better idea would be a basement. And so I knew that my neighbors had a basement out in, uh, in their home. And I ran across the street and I knocked on their door and they weren't home. It was Memorial Day weekend. They were out enjoying the, the great weather and the holiday and so on. And so that's when I thought, I, well, I need to get back into the house. And so I, I turned back around and I ran across the road. And when I was running across the road, um, trying to get into my home, that's when I saw the tornado actually coming down closer to my home. It was within maybe six to eight blocks, and it was swinging back and forth, and it hit a brick schoolhouse, a three-story red brick schoolhouse. And this gray tornado, when it hit that three-story schoolhouse, just destroyed that schoolhouse. I saw the red bricks flying up into the air and filtering back down for what appeared to be many blocks wide. Um, and it was then I realized, wow, this is much too severe of tornado for me to be inside the home. Just I was inside of a wooden structure. So I ran inside my home and I grabbed my wife and I said, we have to get out of the way of this tornado. This is not good. And my wife was very hesitant to leave that area. Of course, the shelter inside and so on. We ran back outside, but I knew from that children's book one lesson. I knew that tornadoes move average at about 30 miles per hour, maximum at 75. And when I saw that tornado moving, um, when I was running back and forth in the street, I could tell it was moving slowly. So I knew we had enough time to get out of the way. And, you know, I always grew up poor. I always had old junk cars that barely run. And I can remember getting into that car and turning that key and hoping that this car started at that point in time. And it, luckily it did this time. And we turned and we actually, since the tornado was going in one direction, we turned and went the opposite direction. We actually, no, excuse me, we didn't go the opposite direction. We headed due north when it was heading east. And why did I do that? It's because that children's book that I had read many years before had told me that tornadoes don't turn on a dime. They don't go backwards. They don't turn due north. They actually go from west to east in the United States, and they always do so. It may vary a little bit, but certainly wouldn't turn and chase me if I got in the car. So we got in the car, and we took off, and we got completely out of its way, and um, then saved our life. So here was this children's book, this little simple book, two or three bucks that actually saved my life. And it wasn't the fancy response teams, it wasn't medical care, it wasn't a hospital, it wasn't ambulances, it wasn't doctors and nurses, it was a children's book that saved my life, saved my wife's life, and that's why I wanna share with you as well these lessons, these, these measures that we can put into effect uh, to lessen the health impact of all of these disasters. And in particular, I wanna share with you in transition now, we're talking about lessening the health impact of tornado disasters. Number one, reducing exposures. That's what I did. I got out of the way of the tornado. Had I stayed there, by the way, my home was completely devastated, destroyed. It was very obvious. Actually, it even took me a long time to find my home. Um, and it was, I would have been obvious that I would have been killed along with my wife as well. So the fact that we reduced our exposure, we got out away from that, and we weren't in the close proximity, that's why I'm here today talking with you. I'm still alive and I'm still appreciating that fact even to this day. So this idea of reducing the exposure is very important. Um, it's highly dependent upon being able to forecast and then being able to detect these types of storms with good forecasting and good early warning systems like that tornado that then told me what to do. Right? And the tornado by itself, of course, I didn't recognize that at first. So once I was able to verify that information and validate that in my mind that, yes, this was a tornado, it was the book that actually taught me what to do after I heard that siren. 
because I could have been in a situation where I never knew where to go, I made bad choices, even if I didn't know how to take cover and so on. All of those things were related to the idea that I had learned. So once again, early warning is one thing, detection is another, but being able to teach the population what to do. So I took my options as well for the first the, the storm shelter idea of being in the center of the house, the second idea of being in the basement, and the third of just making a third decision, and it was the third decision that saved my life to be able to get out of the way. Now I want to say I'm not proposing that you get in cars um, because, uh, in a tornado because actually that is more commonly more of a risk factor than it, has, it is actually a life-saving factor. But for me, I was up against the wall. I had no other alternatives. So risk communication, being able to communicate to people what that risk is, what they face, and how they can protect themselves is keenly important. And you've heard me talk about each one of these things, forecasting, early warning, taking shelter, risk communication, all of these things I've shared with you for nearly every one of the disasters that we've gone through in this particular seminar. The final thing is I want to talk about is reducing exposure in the long term. So the idea of building safer buildings, building um, safe rooms inside homes that have no basement, or recognizing that your basement is actually a storm shelter and being able to put materials there, for example, like weather radio and flashlights and so on, the things that you may need in case of these emergencies and setting that up ahead of time, and then practicing that and taking that drill with your family. In addition as well, of course, tornadoes don't always occur when we're at home. They can occur when we're at work too. So looking at your workplace, where would I go if these storms were uh, to come well, to my workplace? The other thing to recognize as well is the hazard mapping associated with this. Tornadoes don't occur everywhere in the world. As a matter of fact, they don't even occur everywhere in the United States. Some states are relatively spared from tornado disasters completely. So if you are at risk from tornadoes in your particular location, in your community, then you need to take these steps to be able to make a difference in your life and protect those people your, uh, in your family, uh, in your neighborhood, as well as in your community. So there are other measures that we can use to lessen the health impact of tornado disasters, and this is related to reducing vulnerability. Once again, we want healthy people. Healthy people are able to recognize the warning, they're able to understand it and communicate, and they're also able to be able to uh, be mobile and take uh, protective action immediately. And so healthy people actually survive disasters better. So health promotion actually lowers the risk of disaster-related deaths. Lessening the health disparity between different populations as well, and also improving community communication. Very, very key. You can see it took a community warning to be able to save my life in this particular example. And also improved public knowledge. My knowledge of the tornado phenomenon actually is what saved my life. And then the awareness that here's when these occur, here's the time of day you need to be more concerned about and so on, and also things of just keeping in touch with the situational awareness of your community. And, and certainly now, you know, whenever I grew up, there were no cell phones, there were no smartphones and other types of things that could even improve the amount of communication and community cohesiveness. And so we really want to think in terms of reducing people's vulnerability to these particular tornado disasters once again, by making people healthy overall. We can also build capacity in, in different communities that may be at risk for these tornado disasters. Building capacity makes people resilient. It makes safe, healthy, resilient people with access to resources, like economic resources, uh, resources of their livelihood that they can continue to sustain um, work and, and, and economic uh, resources over time. Education that helps them to understand the world better and to be able to apply these lear lessons learned. In addition, also access to health care that make people healthier over time and access to health care in emergency situations as well where that health care may need to be uh, provided immediately and on an emergent basis. We can also build healthy buildings and promote, once again, structural mitigation for tornadoes. So there have been some accomplishments over the years. For example, many people that don't have uh, uh, basements um, now and aren't able to build basements in their home when they're building a brand new home because of the water level may be too high or other factors in the soil itself. Actually, they build safe rooms. They build one uh, a bathroom that actually has concrete all the way around it. And that little bunker inside the home serves as this protective 
the area. Other areas of the home can also be identified to be uh, safe uh, in addition to basements. And actually, people also build storm cellars or storm shelters that they can dig a hole and put that out in the ground itself. And, and so if your home doesn't have that ability to be retrofitted with these type of safe areas, um, we can also do so in the, in the ground itself and your property. Um, also, uh, you know, apartment buildings, very important to recognize where are the safe places in these apartment buildings, especially if we're looking at multi-story buildings that may be at risk for tornadoes. In addition, safe schools and safe hospitals, these are public facilities that are key element, very important populations are in here, and we want to make sure that they're protected as well. So we want to make sure that our schools and our hospitals and many other public buildings, as many as we can actually um, provide better sheltering uh, options for people when they're in these uh, particular facilities. Also, I would encourage you as well, look at your workplace. Um, you uh, business owners that have that opportunity to be able to provide a safer place for your employees. It just keeps your employees safe, allows for that business continuity to continue on. That can be your competitive advantage. Also, healthy communities, you know, they maintain public tornado shelters where if people are in a downtown area, com uh, commercial areas and so on, there's some public places to go. Um, many of these are left over from the old civil defense days uh, where these have been noted. But also communities that recognize that they're at high risk for tornadoes or at a higher risk than, than other communities have taken special steps to be able to maintain public tornado shelters. In addition, these healthy communities can provide siren, they can provide education, for their populations so that they can uh, really understand that early warning once they receive it. So we can also build the capacity to be resilient by building healthy buildings to promote structural and non-structural mitigation for tornadoes. So many people may actually um, provide a, a, you know, a safe room, what's called a safe room in their home where um, when they're building the home, they actually uh, build a bathroom that's entirely encased in, in concrete and reinforced uh, masonry that um, will actually withstand tornado winds. And you don't have to build the entire uh, home uh, to withstand, which is much more expensive, but building one room especially that one small uh, bathroom, for example, uh, can save people's lives because they can go to that area when they hear the warnings. In addition, people uh, recognizing that their basements are actually serve as a storm shelter and they can go below ground in the cellars. There's a safe place down there where you may store the, you know, the, uh, the water and, and uh, st storm radio and, and flashlights and the kinds of things that you may need in case of an emergency. And so recognizing that there are ways to structurally mitigate these uh, tornado related injuries, very important when we're looking at our, at our homes. In addition, our workplaces as well, being able to identify in multi-story buildings or even in apartment buildings or other office buildings, where is the safe place in that building to go and then practicing those drills um, uh, uh, in order to be effective and be uh, you know, efficient with our time when we're evacuating in those populations. Also, safe schools and building safe hospitals that will withstand um, tornado-related uh, uh, wind speeds. Um, safe schools that have safe areas that you can go to. Hospitals that have safe cores where patients can be transported into those areas relatively quickly in order to be able to protect them. These are important and, and vulnerable populations in the schools and hospitals, and we want to make sure that these buildings themselves withstand. I've talked to you before about the safe hospital program that's currently going on now. Very successful actually in Mexico and, and several other countries as well. It's a worldwide movement. I would encourage you to learn more about safe hospitals. It's really a, a very unique and very effective uh, approach to being able to just make uh, these places uh, that we may spend time in a safer and uh, you know, more uh, healthy uh, approach to buildings. And finally, you know, the idea of healthy communities, being able to maintain public tornado shelters in commercial areas where people can, you know, when they're out shopping and doing these kinds of things, have a place to go um, in case a tornado were to occur while they're in that location. Uh, as well, good early warning systems like sirens and, and exercises and, and uh, public awareness campaigns in these communities really maintain that, that high degree of, of awareness and high degree of preparedness that people need. And so healthy communities also um, have the capacity to be resilient.